This is Jesse. This is Sean. And welcome to GenderCast, our trans masculine gender query. Join us as we discuss our journey through gender expression, trans masculine culture, identity, and navigating the binary in our communities. Welcome to GenderCast, episode 29. It's just Sean and Jesse here with you today to talk about our experience at the 11th annual Philadelphia Trans Health Conference, which was May 31st through June 2nd. But before we go there, I just want to say I'm talking on our splendid new microphone right now, and I'm very excited about that. So we wound up getting the mic that we did the fundraiser for, that we posted on the fundraiser the audio technical one and I'm holding it in my hot little hands right now and it's fantastic so it'll be interesting we did a couple trial sessions with it and it sounds pretty clear so we're excited it's very small and transportable and has this little padded bag that it came with so I'm very excited <laughs> that all we need now is like our little microphone a computer and this magic instrument that makes it all talk to each other. It's called the mobile pre. Anyway, thank you for those of you that donated. I know we said thank you last time and we're just super excited to have this new mic. What do you mean it's just Jesse and Sean? <laughs> Are we chopped liver now that we've had guests so much? I'm just trying to figure this out. <laughs> yes, I also want to say thanks to everyone that donated and also to Liz Cruz and all the folks that perform at Debauchery that you know, allowed for not only this mic to be purchased, but us to have a, a cushion so that we can pay for fees for the audio hosts on Libsyn and promotional flyers and stuff like that. Like, it's been really amazing. Thanks, community, for rallying around something that you feel is worthwhile. It's really encouraging for us. So the other thing that the fundraiser helped out with that we talked about last time was getting us to Philly, which we're going to talk about right now. So the first thing we're going to talk about is our presentation which was the first day of the conference, the Thursday. So we presented Thursday afternoon and the name of our session was GenderCast, a podcast by and for the trans community. And we're just gonna talk a little bit about what we talked about in our session. And we did an activity in our session, a language activity, and everyone that participated said we could read some of the stuff that they wrote. So we'll do that. And then we're gonna post some links to some of the things that we talked about. So as we opened up, our workshop, our big items, we're talking about what it means to start up a podcast. And then really what we focused in on a lot was independent media and then media done by and for the trans community and the importance of independent media being done by and for the people that it's about. And then we also talked about having a social justice platform and how important it is to us to get people in front of the mic that don't normally have airtime, especially looking at mainstream media. So Sean did the first part and talked a bit about what it means to have a podcast. So I can give you a small, like one minute synapse of what we talked about. I did type up a page. It's been saved to PDF and it's posted on the gendercast.com website under files so that you have that resource if you want to consult it. But generally we just talked about kind of the bare bones to podcasting. We got a little bit of feedback people wanted more from, but since this was like a trans health conference, we didn't think it was, you know, really meant to like the ins and outs of podcasting. And also, you know, we found out this stuff by just looking online. There's definitely a lot of like, you can find actually classes that are given and they're online books, but specifically YouTube, like a full 80 minute or, or 60 minute lecture on what type of software you need, how to use them in the basic way and stuff like that. So all of this stuff, you can just by Googling how to start a podcast, you could find a lot of it. But basically when we started, we knew that we needed a mic or some kind of headset. So we both went down to Radio Shack and got like the cheapy $25, not the most fashion sensible headsets that we first started to use. And then a friend of ours that had done a little podcasting prior loaned us this other mic that we've been using the monster mic but it sounds really great so we use that but you can definitely do our first couple episodes were definitely on these small headset slash mics then you need to download audacity which is probably the most comprehensive free software unfortunately audacity is only and this does all the editing that we can you know take out the ums and we can do all of this stuff and amplify our voices it's only for pc so i think GarageBand is your option really for all of you Apple folks out there. The other thing that you'll need is an actual website that hosts your audio. So Libsyn does that for us, which is why we had to start another web page because 
Libsyn is not very friendly in the HTML sense. And its basic thing is just to upload. And a quick tip is you always want to upload in MP3s versus WAVE. It takes way less space, and you pay by the space. So that's pretty much it. Like, that's the bare bones. And then you can, you know, get more fancy as you go along. But even during this process, we haven't gotten too much more fancy. It's pretty, pretty chill. So that was what the first segment was about. Yeah, and Sean and I actually met with a local queer organization in, in Seattle and kind of talked to them through getting a podcast up and going. So we'd be happy to direct you to resources and, you know, if you're interested in doing your own podcast. We actually are interested in people that are local to the Puget Sound area that want to start their own podcast around sort of gender-related stuff that might have sort of a different story to tell than Sean and I have sort of supporting that. If you're interested in doing anything like that, please contact us. So the next part of our workshop after we talked a little bit about podcasting 101 was really the importance of independent media. And so we talked a lot about how independent media is an alternative to mainstream media, that mainstream media is based on sponsorship, you know, advertising, it's very capitalistic and corporate influenced and you know, we're completely self-supporting, so we don't have any strings that we have to fulfill in terms of advertising or any sort of larger corporation looking over us. So that was a big piece that we talked about. And then the other piece was doing media buying for the community that we come from. And then basically in that, we got a little bit into our backstory. And for those of you that have been ongoing listeners, you know our backstory. When Sean and I first started up the podcast, we thought it was an important to have. Well, I think you just sort of wanted to start a podcast. <laughs> You're like, there's no podcast for trans guys. And my interest, we've talked about this before, was just that I knew Sean was a little bit more binary about his identity. He was definitely like wanting to be more male identified. And I knew I was more genderqueer. And I felt like that that was a dialogue that didn't always get had between people in the community and so was definitely interested in that. And then we definitely talked about in the workshop the drawback of being two white kids having, you know, white privilege and then coming from somewhat middle class backgrounds, probably more lower middle class backgrounds, but definitely having access to some resources and that that was, you know, our privilege check and something for us to own. Well, I think the other thing, too, that we really tried to stress with this buy and for was how in our workshop we gave a couple examples of how mainstream media often gets it wrong because not only is it about whether or not they're influenced to say something or not say something, but mainly that they just don't know what they're talking about very often. So most of the dialogue that happens is around sensationalistic kind of subject matters, you know, trapped in the wrong body. We played the Anderson Cooper special, like just the small trailer that introduced the film and it was like, dun dun dun, you know, <laughs> like he thought James Bond was going to fly out of there at any moment and blow something up. Like it's just all of these kind of things that we wanted to have a dialogue around and why it's so important for us to have not only an alternative to those stories so that we can actually get it right for our community or at least attempt to have a discussion around what things look like in a real way but also to like shape the conversation that we want to have so beyond the this is the difference between sex and gender a way for us to have a dialogue with a larger community, with a community that's several states away from us, or just in general about what trans identity is, what trans culture is, how that's evolving, what kind of discussions do we want to have versus trying to educate or raise awareness to someone that's never seen a trans person or has really no affiliation with a queer community. Like, when are we going to get beyond having that conversation over and over again and actually just have conversations about what it actually is to live in this world outside of the gender binary? Right. And in that, we were able to talk a lot about how important intersectionality is and that none of us are just a trans person. We're a trans person who is also a person of color or a person with a disability or a person that's experienced some sort of trauma in their history or a person that has experienced sexism and that we don't come to the table just as like this sort of unidimensional thing. And it is that sort of sex versus gender, sort of Chaz Bono type of conversation that we really wanted to be mindful about putting voices behind the mic that didn't get their stories told. And we showed some bad examples of media like Sean talked about. We had the audience listen to three or four clips from different episodes where we had talked about 
gender definitely was infused in these topics, but we played a clip from the Feminism 101 episode, and we played a clip from the episode on trans misogyny, and we played a clip on the episode that Matilda had done with us and talked sort of about broader queer culture and talked about assimilation. And I feel like when we get stuck in sort of that trans narrative, it's sort of like a flat kind of thing and it doesn't go very deep and it doesn't show like the breadth of human experience that trans people usually come to the table with. And so a lot of what we talked about was sort of that and also at the same time wanting to not have ourselves sensationalized and what gets left out in sort of mainstream media. And then that kind of brought us to do the activity. We wanted to interact with our audience. But one of the things we really wanted to get at was that even within our own community, you know, we struggle to have a common language about what some of the terms we use are, you know, and that evolves. What queer is today is very different than what queer was 15 years ago. And do we use the word tranny? Are we allowed to use it? A conversation our community has behind closed doors with our friends and if we are struggling to find common language, how then is mainstream media that's totally detached from and has no real experience to draw from supposed to get it right or even supposed to be informed? So I think that that was a challenge that we posed and we got some really good responses. But the other thing that we talked about too, which I think personally was my favorite among our workshop was challenging folks to think about is any media coverage around trans identity or trans culture, good media. And of course, one of our favorite topics to harp on is Chaz Bono, how for myself, I feel like in one way, it, it's good to have someone out there that's trans identified, that's visible. So folks kind of have an understanding of what trans looks like to some small degree, but realize that I feel like in a lot of ways, the narrative that he puts out there is doing a disservice to like expanding what trans identity is or what what other things around intersectionality come to the table when someone's trans as far as access to things or education level or communities and families and all of these things. It's really different to be a celebrity with, you know, a fairly good amount of monetary resources versus someone that's a youth, maybe a person of color and has less access to even have that dialogue, let alone the resources to do any kind of medical transition if they wanted to. So that was my favorite for sure. Yeah. And part of what I was trying to get at earlier was in terms of single identity politics and coming together, you know, around one thing that we all have in common, being trans, sort of leaves a lot of things at the door and leaves a lot of things out and tends to become more of a white culture conversation. And that actually happened in a couple of the workshops that I attended that we'll talk about later. And so one of the things that we talked about was coming together around a shared oppression but then being mindful of all the different aspects of people's identities that they're coming into the room with, that that's really important to us, especially as two white kids from Seattle. So our intern, Gilligan, was with us every step of the way in the workshop and did a really good job when we did this language activity of kind of writing down sort of a cloud on the whiteboard of all the definitions that folks had come up with. And so what we did is we broke everybody into groups of two and we had them pick a couple words that they wanted to define. And the first word that they picked was transmasculine and the second word that they picked was femme. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so we asked everybody to actually turn in the words that they defined. They all defined it by themselves and then read it to their neighbor or their group. And everyone turned in their card. We're okay with us reading some of the definitions on the podcast. And I actually think we talked a lot about the word transmasculine in the beginning, and it's come up since then. And I know the word femme has come up quite a bit. I know that Maddox talked about his version of femme in the bisexuality episode, but I'm really excited because we actually have all these index cards sitting in front of us right now. And so we're going to read you a few of the transmasculine definitions and a few of the femme definitions, and you can see how your definition might juxtapose up against these ones. So we did not sift through all of these a second time to like pick our favorites, but we're just going to read a few quickly. And if they left a name, it meant that it was okay to give them a, a shout out. So this one is coming from Cass Mercer, who was there. Transmasculine, I love that they put adjective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, buddy. Describing population of people or an individual who identify with experience slash express a gender that falls under a spectrum identified as masculine by society, especially when that expression does not meet society's expectations of the person's gender, likely based on sex. So this person put transmasculine is a person who was assigned female sex at birth, who identifies with the masculine as it is socially constructed in their culture. Person leaning to more masculine gender expression or identity who may likely be ID'd at birth as female. 
And this person wrote, and this was Catherine, who is 44 years old and this is mom of a F to M person. And she wrote, transmasculine is spectrum of gender presentation, quote, masculine, unquote, less. And then she drew an arrow to more and put arrows at each side of that. So I'm not exactly sure what that means, but it looks pretty cool. <laughs> it was like a spectrum. <laughs> Trying to get at the spectrum ideas. Okay, so... My personal favorite, you know, is the femme. I'm a big fan of both the word and the folks that identify as femme. So femme, any person identifying as being on the feminine side of the gender spectrum? Femme, a gender identity or presentation that is performative and expresses the more polar female traits slash stereotypes, parentheses, if we're assuming it is a continuum, end parentheses, often seems to be reclaiming power for people who identify with these activities slash presentations slash stereotypes. And my personal favorite, non-gender specific fabulousness. So those are just a few of the definitions that folks gave in the language activity, but I really like the room definitely lit up with energy as people got a chance to talk about language. And what I learned from that was you know, giving people space to just talk about these common words that we hear and see a lot. I mean, even when you pull up our Facebook page or our website, you see our trans masculine gender query and all of you out there might be thinking something different when you see the word trans masculine. And we actually talked about that a little bit in the workshop that really Sean and I found that to be the most open word that really encompassed where we were both coming from being assigned female sex at birth, but really sort of exploring kind of the masculine continuum of our own trans identities. And so it's interesting that people might find that limiting in who might listen or who might not listen, especially when you pair it with the variety of topics that we've explored. Because in now 29 episodes, I would say maybe five, four are really like trans masculine specific. Even in our healthcare one, I think Jennifer covered both sides. So it's just interesting how language really kind of defines things. And that was really what we were hoping to get out of that activity and people seem to enjoy it. So I think the next thing we're gonna talk about is what we really enjoyed, a, a few high points, kind of like we did the last Gender Odyssey episode, some things that we enjoyed and some things that we feel like we're missing or we would have liked to see or maybe some ideas for years to come. So why don't we get started on the things we really enjoyed? I went to opening ceremonies and I actually really enjoyed the level that this conference has been sort of put at in terms of the Philadelphia community. The mayor came and spoke and opened it. It was just swarming with people. They said this was their biggest turnout yet. There was over like almost 2000 people there. So huge. I think something Sean just said that we both really thought was fantastic about this conference is that it was free. The other trans conferences that we've looked into that happen nationally, including the one happening here in Seattle called Gender Odyssey all have a cost associated. So the fact that they're able to keep this conference free, I mean, was definitely great for us. All we had to worry about was airfare and hotels. So, I mean, that in and of itself was amazing. There was tons of vendors. So sort of the outside kind of hallway in between all the different workshop rooms were always a buzz. And so even if you got a little burnt out on a workshop, you could definitely wander around and there was just people everywhere. And I definitely enjoyed getting a little bit more of an East Coast trans flavor going on. I really also enjoyed that it was pretty 50-50 trans feminine people and trans men and trans masculine people and allies and providers, like a pretty good mix of people. I didn't see it sort of heavy one way or the other. And then one session I went to, which was called Pretty Boys and Fem Guys, Feminine Trans Guys Discussion, was put on by Jack Stringer. And Jack had mentioned that this was the first year they actually had a fem track within the conference. And I don't identify as fem, but I definitely identify as fag and more effeminate. So I really enjoyed that being on the workshop agenda. And once I actually went to the workshop, it was very interesting, the twists and turns that the conversation took and how I would say probably the first half an hour of the workshop became a very white culture-esque conversation until a person of color stood up and called that out and said, Everything that you're saying is great if you're sort of moving within white culture, but in other culture, one person talked about Asian Pacific Islander culture and another person talked about African American culture and being sort of a faggy trans man navigating that culture. And so, you know, I definitely saw people sort of hairs rising and, and people getting called out on some of the conversation they were having. And then 
definitely wanting to own privilege and then other people having no idea what privilege they walked into the room with. And sort of circling back to Gilligan's write-up about the conference, I sort of went in wanting people to sort of have like an awareness, but then just sitting in this huge room of all these people talking and just realizing that everybody has to have their process and everybody gets to sort of be where they're at with the privilege that they have and the oppression that they're facing. And it actually came up in several workshops that I went to where there was such a variety of that in the room where people were coming from. So anyway, that was the session that I really enjoyed. I definitely went to a few others that I thought were good as well, but I'll let Sean talk now. So the one that I really liked, of course, because it was like health related and research based, <laughs> duh, was called The Effects of Testosterone on Mental Health and Sexuality, FTM slash Genderqueer People. And it was basically a presentation done by Sam Davis and Colt Meyer. It was some research that was compiled during Sam's dissertation several years ago with a live interview with like, I think about 200 folks in San Francisco, and then also an online survey that Colt Meyer has just done. I think it got recently published actually in one of the LGBTQ type of health journals. So it basically looked at the effects of testosterone and chest surgery on depression, anxiety, anger, body image, and sexuality in FTM identified and genderqueer identified folks. And so what they basically saw w was, and it's been a little while, but this is my understanding that I can reflect on, is that folks that were unable to start testosterone or were not on testosterone were more anxious, more depressed, had more feelings around anger, and had less positive body images about themselves. And so basically there were similar results to folks that were on testosterone to folks that were on testosterone and had had surgery. Uh, and th that group varied immensely from the folks that were not on testosterone. However, the body image one was interesting because there was no significant difference between folks that were not on T and folks that were on T, but a significant difference between the folks that were on T and had chest surgery. Something that I can definitely attest to that, yes, it's been awesome that I'm on testosterone, but it's become more problematic around my body image to still have a uh, perceived female chest. Yeah, the double B, the beard and boobs. I mean, you know, like all of these things that we go through where we're like, oh, it's more resembling what I want, but may not resemble in these other ways. And I think that that's definitely the case. So that's what they were looking at. And I think part of the reason that they're trying to present a case is so that uh, be more persuasive to insurance companies that it's in our best interests health-wise for these you know, indicators to show that we should have access to medical transition in whatever way we see fit. So I really liked that one. And then I think I also really liked the one with this guy from Eastern Europe, you know, as someone that's lived abroad, I really wanted to see, and I'm really interested in doing this at a future date, what it looks like to be trans and go through possible medical transition in other countries. And this speaker was from Serbia and really talked about how little access they have to not only the LG community, but to trans community. And that it's really, in some ways, you know, the government sees this as like, no one's really gay. So if you are trans, it's like a medical issue. So of course they provide for funding and they give you access to both hormones and surgeries. However, there's no community to be had there. So I found his story to be really compelling. He was a great speaker and really just talked about what it looks like to live in a country that has gone through several wars and what he defined as more of a military outlook on what men are supposed to be, which he had said something like men are not gay because men are soldiers, even though that's not the case. Obviously we know that it's, that's kind of how the government views it. And that's why the community doesn't have access to congregate. And you know, it's just really not accepted still there. So I really enjoyed that. I also went to another one called patriarchy from a trans man's perspective. And what it was supposed to be was a couple trans guys from Uganda talking about patriarchy from a trans man's perspective there. But what it wound up being was everybody in the workshop talking about their own experience with sexism, misogyny, and patriarchy. That one took some very interesting twists and turns and got a little heated, again, with the privilege the unexamined privilege and sort of a white culture type of conversation. So different kind of vibe than Gender Odyssey. I know we talked about Gender Odyssey last year and the workshops I went to at Gender Odyssey were very much like sitting in a circle and more processy where there was some processing, but I felt like more presentations were actually delivered, more information was imparted and the sessions were big. I mean, there was a lot of people in them and so people definitely had to like step up to be able to talk. I guess, again, 
the best part was probably the networking. We met some folks from Ohio. We met some folks from Kentucky. We definitely met folks from New York and Philly. So I definitely like enjoyed networking opportunities. It felt like a lot kind of mashed in and there were so many workshops going on at the same time. I had a hard time choosing and some of them would get full. So I think that it was a way bigger turnout than what they were expecting. But I actually don't have a lot of complaints. I think for a free conference, um, especially one geared towards the trans community, there's a lot of different topics and dialogues to be had and a huge smattering of different folks presenting and a pretty big variety of different people presenting at the conference. And as always, I'll be a little more critical about the conference. <laughs> so what I did also like about it is that, of course, it's accessible in the way that it was free and really encouraged various folks to be able to come for one day or for a couple hours. And they, they had a lot of workshops and I really did like that they had a spiritual component represented and covering sex, pornography, as well as partners and, you know, different topics were really represented. There was a youth track for, I think it was like 18 and younger, but mainly geared towards, I think, adolescent folks. There was stuff for parents of youth that are trans identified. The Transgender Law Center was there presenting around how to take a community issue and make it a movement and maybe see something happen in your local community, a need met that you have seen or your community agrees needs to be looked at. So there was a lot of that, but one of the things I found kind of difficult was that it seemed like oftentimes all of the workshops in this particular type of interest would be presented at the exact same time, so you had to choose. So if it was about social justice, it's like five different topics about social justice. So if you're really into that, you really only got to see one. And then later in the day, there wouldn't be really anything you were that interested in seeing. So I think that that could be kind of like scattered a, a bit more. But I think, you know, not so different than Gender Odyssey, what I definitely am struggling with as someone that's more binary identified is that and this is only my assumption because I'm new to the trans community as far as, you know, I'm like a year and a half into T and wasn't trans identified several years ago, is that what I think may have happened, and this is what I get from small conversations I've had here and there, is that binary identified F to Ms really got a lot of airtime and took up these workshops and really weren't welcoming of more gender fluid, gender queer types of identities or trans bag identities. So that voice got stomped out. And now I feel like they're making a lot of room for that, but I think that in a lot of ways, there's not an equal airtime for folks that are binary identified. And I can argue and say, well, maybe it's just folks are really demanding that, but I also can realistically say that maybe it's that more binary folk opt out of coming back to the trans community because it feels for me like at least a gender odyssey. And then again, at the Philly conference that there's really a lot of discussion around trans fag identified folks and dating trans men dating cis men or trans men dating men but then really nothing for trans men that want to date women you know things i want to talk about is how do you meet the parents what does it look like to be someone that is learning how to be in these male roles later in life versus how do you bond with someone's parents around male identity or how do I be a parent later, teach my kid what a good father looks like in these things. And arguably you can say, well, you just be the good person that you are and that'll come through. But I think there's a lot of roles, dynamics that we encounter as men that are less experienced being men, navigating, dating and everything that comes along with that and fitting into more cis lifestyle that we didn't really get exposed to or how to tone down our narrative about our past life, not give ourselves away or the feelings that we struggle with about do we tell someone do we not tell someone what does that look like for the value we place on our previous female identified life experience like all of these things and i just feel like sometimes like that's just not a conversation folks are interested in other things which you know i'm happy to entertain but sometimes i definitely walk away feeling the best conversations i have are with other binary ish identified folks and we talk about these things and if we're talking about it at a conference like this like why isn't there actual dialogue built into workshops so that was my beef with that but like jesse i did really enjoy meeting a lot of people i met a lot of folks that i've watched on youtube pre-transition medically and also now and i met ashton who is the first person that gave us that sport cartoon you know i knew him i don't know him but i know him right it's so weird so i thought that was really interesting to see folks they're like your transition buddies as far as timelines and you watch their videos and they watch yours but you actually don't know each other but then you get to meet in person it was really a great experience so i really enjoyed that part of the conference immensely really enjoyed getting to meet the art of transliness guys too that was awesome adrian and zach do you want to talk a little bit about fun stuff 
that the conference had. So one thing I definitely enjoyed about the conference is every night that we were there, there was an event going on. One of the events was spoken word and live performances and Catastrophe performed his new song. I think that was Thursday night. And then Friday night, there was a big OP party with a super fun photo booth and in this three level type club place where people that you may not have gotten to talk to first, you could kind of talk to in a little bit more relaxed atmosphere. And then just sort of other events going on. There was a big drag show at a community center that was all ages the last night of the conference. So definitely a variety of stuff going on throughout Philadelphia and the community sort of really coming out and showing support. So I, I probably enjoyed socializing at this conference more so than at other ones I've been to and liked just sort of going out and getting like to know people and getting to like hang out. I thought that was really fun. I do agree. The nighttime activities were really fun. It's funny because... I hadn't really been to Philadelphia since I was the school field trip and when I was a young child. But going back, I actually, since Kat, our previous intern, who's a good friend of mine, also came to the conference, it was so good to go there. And actually, one of my best experiences there was after the event kind of petered out and it was just the folks that usually go and hang out and do karaoke. And it was so good to see their energy. And I really, really had a great time in Philly with the folks there. They were just like so welcoming to each other and you could just see it that there's this community that's really really strong you know and watching everybody be really vulnerable with their artistic expression cheering them on i really enjoyed that i think they could improve for sure and i say this because i watched our intern not be able to hang out with us as much is that while they provided some small events that were all ages the majority of places were at bars so i really felt sad that there couldn't be more of community building around that but it was awesome to meet trans bodies, trans cells folks. We did that community forum here and I got to meet Amanda and it was good to be there for that because I, I support that project. So yeah, that was Philly in a nutshell. We did have a pool too. We randomly got this really great deal, like one of the cheapest deals we could find for hotels and it had a pool on the roof. So what an awesome experience to go and really just enjoy our immediate community with Kat and Gilligan being there and meeting Gilligan for the first time after he's come on board, but also all these folks that have been discussing inadvertently with article shares and stuff like that online for so long. So yeah, Philly, it is. It is the town of brotherly love. I'm into it. Yeah, I would just echo that. I definitely had a good time. I have a good friend that lives there that came out and hung out with us a little bit too. I don't think I saw much of you throughout the conference. I think we sort of spun out in different directions. And I I noticed a lot of a pretty broad age range, but not a lot of people sort of within my age range, either a lot younger, or a lot older. And maybe that's just a problem with being in your mid thirties. I, I often feel that way in queer community. So I definitely think there were opportunities, though, to talk to people and to network, and I'm hoping that the Kentucky folks will write in, and I know they took some flyers back. I feel like we definitely got some opportunities for coalition building and cross-coordinating and, like Sean said, getting to meet people in person. So other than that, I think that wraps up our episode on the Philly Trans Health Conference, and I think we'll move into check-ins. I do just want to do a small shout out to Jacob and Jen. The kids from Kentucky, the Tramp Lab. I will never be into bourbon, Jameson, until I die, but it was so fun to experiment with a uh, crossing over of sorts. You guys rocked. I had a great time with you. Okay, so for check-ins, we're actually going to have an interview coming up about an event that's happening in Seattle called Transmission, and Sean will be hosting that interview, so stay tuned for that. And we'll also have an interview with Toby Hill Meyer about one of her upcoming projects. And the other thing I just wanted to give a quick check-in around is I went to an event put on by the YUIR group, Youth Undoing Institutional Racism, and they come out of the People's Institute which is a large institute in Seattle, and they do a lot of community organizing and a lot of training around undoing institutional racism. And it's the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. And this is their youth program. And their youth program has decided to focus on the prison industrial complex as one of their main areas that they wanna do some community organizing around. So this whole event was all youth led and youth directed. They talked about what the prison industrial complex is. For those of you that listened to the episode that we just did with Walida Imarisha, she talks a lot about and explains what the prison industrial complex is and why it's important to get involved. And from my perspective, you know, 
some of the most oppressed people are youth of color, especially poor youth of color. And then when you add in being trans on top of that, you've pretty much got folks experiencing oppression around almost all the aspects of their identity. So they really broke down what the PIC is. They talked about some strategies for organizing and then they broke us up in groups at the end and everybody sort of participated in sort of ideas moving forward how we might fight the prison industrial complex. It was really invigorating and just amazing to be part of all these amazing youth of color talk about the prison industrial complex and what they want to do about it and how wrong it is. and. They have an ongoing forum. If you're here in Seattle, you can participate in and get involved. And what I really like about what they're doing is it's really putting the voices that are most marginalized front and center. And they talked about how media is one of the things that really like perpetuates the prison industrial complex. And so I talked to them a little bit about how important independent media is, especially independent media done by and for the people most affected. So. Maybe a spinoff project or something will come out of this, but I'll post links to the People's Institute and to the group that's starting this prison industrial complex work group. And if you're here in Seattle and you want to get more involved, you can check it out there. Also, as we all know, it's getting that time of year where the vote is coming up. Here in Seattle, speaking of the PIC, there is Prop 1. We will not sway you either way, but we encourage you to check it out and get involved and look into it and... Vote. Everybody should vote. Welcome to episode 29 check-ins. We are going to have two guests come on and tell us a little bit about their projects and what's going on with them. First up, we have Logan Brock that is here to talk about the queer social club that's local here in Seattle, as well as the upcoming showcase of trans and genderqueer art and artist entitled Transmission. It'll be on August 3rd and 4th. We're going to have links to all of this. First up, we asked most of our guests to tell folks out there listening a little bit about themselves. So do you want to introduce yourself? I'm Logan. I'm a queer trans guy, one of the proprietors of Queer Social Club, putting on the project Transmission. For folks out there that don't know about the Queer Social Club and what Transmission is going to be about, can you tell us a little bit about the Queer Social Club, what it is, how it got started, what your role is, and then we'll move on to a little bit more about Transmission. Okay, Queer Social Club was my partner's idea, Annie Terrell. It was originally just a monthly meetup where people could come and sit and relax and talk to each other where they could actually hear each other instead of at a bar or a dance party. That's still the core concept and happens on the fourth Thursday of every month at High Five Pie in Seattle. When we were doing that meetup, though, we realized that everyone we know and everyone we were getting to know through Queer Social Club had these amazing projects happening. Arts and social justice and small business and, you know, podcasts community service, stuff like that. So everybody's a badass queer rock star in their own field, right? And we're all kind of vying for the same limited resources like grant money and audience and donors, customers, venues. So Queer Social Club kind of evolved into a resources hub to try and harness the community's collective skills and resources so that we can use each other as resources. So when, say, a social justice organization needs to have a fundraiser, the arts people can help put on a show. And when the artists have a show, the social justice folks can help rally an audience with all of their followers. But all of that kind of stuff starts with a conversation, with sitting around the big table at High Five Pie and making a connection with people. And that's what our monthly meetup is about. Community building is at the core of everything we do. It's funny that you mentioned the sitting around a big table. I feel like so many times on our various episodes, we talk about coming back to the table as far as community building and discussing some hard topics and what perfect way to not only realize people's talents in our community and, and get to know folks, but to enjoy pie while you're doing that. So Hi-Fi is awesome for um, welcoming you guys in and having that space for some gathering monthly. So for folks out there that are local and natives to Seattle, you probably have seen some advertisements for transmission around. I'm looking at this awesome business card sized flyer that talks about the showcase as well as the dates and stuff. So what is Transmission and why was it a project you felt was important or how did you become interested in putting something like this on and organizing it and when folks think about coming, what can they expect? Well, Transmission is kind of our premier project as a producing entity of Queer Social Club. It is a showcase of trans and gender queer art and artists. We will have spoken word, film, burlesque, cabaret dancers, performance artists, musicians, aerialists, 
puppets. I mean, everything you can imagine. And you can eat the show. Thanks to our friend Sully at the Kitchen Sink Project, we literally have a little taste of each performer for you. And they're amazing performers, too. I honestly could not believe the artists that we got for the show. Neon and Leon Beige are emceeing the main show for both nights. We have local favorites like Shardana and Lou. Athens Boys Choir came all the way from Brooklyn. Paris Original, Amber Flame. Friday night is the Seattle premiere of Gold Moon Sharp Arrow, which I know a lot of people have been waiting and waiting for. Both nights are going to be really incredible, and each night is totally different, so you definitely want to get a two-night ticket. That sounds awesome. Not only the uh, food part of the show. Uh, who came up with that idea? We knew we wanted to have Sully and Kitchen Sink Project involved because Sully's awesome. So we brought it to Sully, and he was amazing and brought up this idea of having a different little piece of something for each artist, which is just kind of brilliant. And <laughs> I love Sully <laughs> and the Kitchen Sink Project. How did he go about creating flavors or treats for someone? Did, did anybody have to sign off on that? Or was this his own imagination with like what the art is going to be for that performer? Or how did that work out? Well, he's actually been working directly with the performers. There's been kind of an email exchange going back and forth to ask people like, what do you feel like your flavor is? And, <laughs> and what is your art like? And that kind of stuff. So he worked with every single artist. And there's about 24 of them in the show all together to create their own little flavor. So it's like a whole extra aspect of art, nice. sensory indulgence kind of deal. I'm definitely a fan. I mean, maybe that should be our new question instead of saying, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? We just, well, what's your flavor? Maybe we should incorporate that. <laughs> it also sounds like this is going to be an awesome show. I mean, one of the things that I love about Seattle is that there is a lot of live performance art, but sometimes I feel that there's so much burlesque that kind of just dominates the queer like art showcase scene. Uh, so I'm really excited to see some other folks that bring to the table different types of art that you just don't have access to or usually is like a separate night of entertainment versus something that's all together. So that sounds excellent. I know Jesse and I are going to be there for sure to check these folks out. So when you were thinking about transmission and you got folks to sign on and artists to come and, and people come in to you know, either promote or perform, and then the collaboration with Kitchen Sink, what was the kind of goal you envisioned for getting the community together to celebrate kind of queer arts here in Seattle? And it's really risky to put on an event sometimes where you're putting out your personal money and hoping that people respond. What's been your experience with that? Well, my work on transmission comprises two major concepts for me. One, I've spent over half my life in professional performing arts and entertainment. When I moved to Seattle, I found that there were a couple of production companies putting on shows to raise funds for local nonprofits, which is awesome, and I worked with them. Queer Social Club intends to produce events like that in the future. The problem is that everyone involved in those shows, technicians, performers, photographers, graphic designers, everyone, is either a volunteer or ridiculously underpaid for their work, while the bars that these shows are set up in are steadily profiting from the art that we create there, which is not so great. And the thing that people need to understand is that many, many performers, technicians, photographers, graphic designers, all those people I just mentioned are professional artists. We do this for a living. And every single time any show depends on volunteer performers or, and this drives me crazy, amateur stage kittens that are working their way up to being a performer, I'm a stagehand, so that drives me insane. It undermines the livelihood of the artists and technicians who have dedicated their entire life to their craft. Don't get me wrong, everybody is happy to volunteer sometimes, but throwing a fundraiser show now and then is a completely different concept than building an entire production company on the backs of professionals who are donating their time and skills. And I've had so many people ask me, who are you donating transmissions proceeds to? Because there seems to be this expectation in Seattle that artists should be working for free, that art exists to raise money for some other cause. Well, as far as I'm concerned, art is its own statement. It is its own social justice. It is its own revolution. And it is a valid, valuable contribution to the community dialogue for which people should be fairly compensated. That said, it is Queer Social Club's primary function to build community and share resources. So we invited every social justice organization every community service project and activist that we could think of to come and participate to get some community exposure and tell us about their message. We're not charging for info tables. We're not charging for advertising in the program because we want these organizations present. We want this to be a part of what we present as Queer Social Club. And we still have some room if anybody wants to come and show off their organization and their projects. 
the second main concept and, and kind of primary motivator behind transmission specifically is to create a space for transgender and genderqueer artists to show their stuff. There's not nearly enough of that space even in a city like Seattle. These artists are usually scattered all over the arts community in shows and venues where either their gender identity is tolerated by the producers or where they were added specifically to create the impression of diversity, which is not only an insult to the artist, but also shows a complete lack of appreciation for the art itself. Because what ends up happening is that they are considered edgy for who they are without any real consideration given to what they have created. And this is why I felt transmission was really important. I mean, even in the queerest Seattle performance spaces, I've heard audience members gasp when a performer reveals their top surgery scars. And it's great that that space exists to show queer bodies and make that more familiar to everybody, but this is a totally different concept. Our intent here is to create a space where the diversity of gender is a given, like people walk in knowing that, knowing what they're gonna see as far as gender presentation. And that leaves room for artists to showcase what they've actually created. And if those creations are part of the dialogue about gender, that's great. If the art they present is completely unrelated to the artist's gender identity, that's great too. Yeah, I think it's so important to have space where that conversation isn't a necessity or the common baseline is first we got to talk about this, then we can talk about anything else I bring to the table. So what a unique time and space to be able to come together as a queer community and know that we're already queer and be like, I'm queer and I do all this other stuff and just leave that out. Unless you really want to have a discussion about it and you initiate it. I mean, we talk about sometimes just getting really tired of educating in general. I can only imagine the different barriers you have as an artist where you, every part of your identity is there and it's always going to be incorporated into your art because you are the art that that conversation sometimes has got to get old. Yeah, that's exactly the point is that artists don't have to explain themselves first and then go into their art. They can just do their thing. So I know we talked about Kitchen Sink Project a little bit. I know you brought with you kind of the small tagline for them in regards to what they're about, but it's so important to build community and collaborate. Like that's really, I feel like the largest resource we have as a community is to reach out to one another and have these conversations and provide resources and, and space to work together. So can you also talk about what other organizations you might want to partner with in the future that are also coming to the table in regards to the showcase and your experience with having support in the community and reaching out? Yeah, community outreach. I was a little surprised because I'm from the South. Community outreach has been really fantastic. As the new kids on the block in Seattle, I was a little nervous about it. And there's been a little bit of hesitation from some of the bigger, more established organizations. We're hoping that as we grow and have more resources and have more to show that more organizations will use the resources that we have and use us as a resource. For the most part though, as soon as we announced Transmission, I started hearing from artists and community activists that were super excited about the project. Gender Odyssey has been awesome. You guys at GenderCast have been fantastic. Number One Must Haves and Lick and High Five Pi, of course, and Babeland, Butch Queen, Studio Current, Velocity, the Office of Cultural Affairs in Seattle, just, so many people, so much support, I can't even name all of them. I was totally blown away by wave after wave of incredibly enthusiastic support and people's excitement. It's really incredible to get a real taste of, of what the Seattle queer community has to offer and makes me feel really lucky to be a part of it. Kitchen Sink Project is our primary producing partner and they have been totally phenomenal. Sully Bill's Kitchen Sink Project, I just think this is great. I took this straight off their website. It's one urbanite's quest to cultivate art, music, culture, education, and community through food. Their core philosophy is that food is the common bond among all people, regardless of age, identity, or status. They believe in eating and learning together creates lasting relationships and helps build community and spread knowledge. For us, like I said a little bit about earlier, they're creating little hors d'oeuvres and cocktails that represent each artist in the show. So it's like pairing wine with cheese, except they're pairing amazing food and drink with amazing art because Sully is a genius. Everyone should check them out at kitchensinkproject.com. So is there anything about the evening or the weekend that you're really looking forward to? Um, is it the food that you're going to be tasting? Uh, are, there, are there any artists that you have been watching kind of like develop their art? What are you most excited about? Well, as the producer, I got to preview all of the film, so I've seen that already. And I've been watching people kind of develop their pieces 
in other shows leading up to transmission. So I'm really excited about the culmination of a couple of pieces. There's a brand new performer coming to us that just took Dr. Ginger Snap's class about burlesque and is going to come and premiere their piece on our stage and bring that together. There's Amber Flame, who is an amazing spoken word artist who has a brand new piece just for transmission. I'm really excited about Athens Boys Choir because I've never actually gotten to see them perform. It's all kinds of amazing, amazing stuff. I'm just so taken aback by the people that were attracted to this project. Yeah, Athens Boy Choir, I actually had an opportunity to see them and Rocco perform in like the basement of somebody's house randomly up in the U district. And I was like, what is going on? But it was awesome. I'm super excited to see what they, what they're going to bring to the showcase. And I guess for all you folks out there listening, what's some, one of the most important things that you would really want people to hear about the queer social club and the event that you're excited to tell them about? Well, the most important thing that I want people to take from hearing this podcast is that Queer Social Club isn't my project and it isn't Annie's project. Queer Social Club belongs to the community. We are taking our cues from all of you, so we genuinely want to hear from you, especially if you need resources for your projects. Even if you have no idea what we might be able to do for you, get in touch with us. Let's figure it out together. It's about sharing resources and building community and making all of our projects better together. We're actually counting on that community building skill right now so that people come out and prove what I've said here about the value of art and show these transmission artists that the community values what they contribute. We're super excited to see that happen and really hope everyone will join us. So yeah, all you folks out there, Seattleites in particular that are local, please join both GenderCast and all of the artists and the amazing folks that put this on Kitchen Sink and taste that good food. Everybody out of town that's coming for Gender Odyssey, hopefully it'll be a really good mix of -of out-of-towners and uh, locals. Again, it's August 3rd and 4th. We'll get the details out, but show the love, support this new project and your local artist. Thank you guys so much for having us, and we really appreciate all the work that you do. Transmission is the same weekend as Gender Odyssey, next weekend. That's Friday, August 3rd, and Saturday, August 4th. Doors are at 8.30, show starts at 9, dance party starts at 11-ish at Washington Hall on 14th Avenue in Seattle. You can link to tickets through our Facebook page at facebook.com slash QSC Seattle or through our website at queersocialclub.com. And we will be posting all of these links per usual on our website and the episode links. Hope to see you guys there. Next on the check-ins for episode 29, I am here again with the renowned and loved Toby Homeyer. It's one of our most popular episodes when Toby came on to talk about transmisogyny. And as we also did on that episode of Check In around their erotic projects, she is looking for funding and has reached actually the the minimum goal that they wanted to have for this new project called Doing It Again In-Depth. I guess it's going to be two volumes and depending on kind of the funding, they might even have a third installation. So I'm going to let her talk about the project, where the fundraising is right now and all of that good stuff. So the film Doing It Again in Depth is going to be an erotic documentary that looks at relationship and hookup dynamics among trans women and our partners. And it's actually going to weave together extensive interview footage with explicit sex scenes to kind of paint a a full portrait of each person involved in the film. And so, yeah, like you were saying, we have a Kickstarter and we have raised the basic minimum budget, which is really exciting. And I'm hoping to get a lot more because it's actually really a bare bones budget just to pay for the DVD replication and pay the people in the film. And so we have another goal that we're getting close to to hire a subtitler to make the film more accessible to everyone and another goal not too far beyond that that would have a a travel budget so that we could get more people involved and the one that I'm really excited about is if we get enough funding we'll have a, a third volume so this is a two volume set one focusing on trans women with trans partners and one focusing on trans women with cis partners. And so if we get that third volume, then we'll have it focusing on genderqueer and non-binary folks, both genderqueer and non-binary trans women, and also trans women with genderqueer and non-binary partners. And so all of this is, is really exciting. We have just under two weeks to continue with the Kickstarter. And 
kind of running along the same time period. I have a casting call out there for anyone who might be interested. We're specifically looking for straight trans women, trans women with male partners, cis or trans, trans women of color, people of color in general, and people over 40. Awesome. Well, it sounds like you're on your way. Do you have any folks involved already that have signed on that you might want to give folks like a preview? So if you go to the Kickstarter page, you can see a video with some of the preliminary footage. And it's really rough footage that hasn't been edited very much. And these are from four different scenes that I shot. Now these scenes may or may not end up in the final film, depending on what other options come up in the casting call. But that's definitely something to check out. And while I can't really confirm anything, we very well might have the famous Drew DeVoe returning being a part of this project as well. Exciting, exciting. And again, for anybody out there listening that might want to get involved, um, you can contact Toby. We'll provide all the information on our website um, so that you can both donate as well as um, perhaps contact Toby about being in the film. All right, that wraps up episode 29. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you soon. Copyright 2011, GenderCast, our transmasculine gender query. All podcast content and information related to these podcasts are the property of GenderCast producers and may not be used without our written consent. Contact GenderCast at gmail.com for written permission. Girls who are boys who like boys to play.